Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. I'm in Toronto and we're going to go to Woburn, Massachusetts, and we're going to go to Washington, D.C. today. And we're going to talk about biodiversity. I have two fellows here who are very concerned about the loss of biodiversity in this world, and they're going to tell us what we need to do. Uh, one of them is uh, Jim Laurie, who's in Woburn, Massachusetts. He is a biologist, and I've, I've been looking at some of his previous YouTube shows, and we're really uh, going to be, he's got some slides with him, so watch out for those slides. Okay, in Washington, D.C. is Philip Bogdanov, and Phil, I knew a little bit when he was focusing more on peace than he was on the biodiversity, so we're sort of long-time acquaintances. Hi, Phil, how are you? Okay, so uh, both of you guys are in, uh, involved in some way with a, an outfit called Biodiversity for a Livable Planet. Is that the title? Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. Climate, good. All right. Well, why don't you start us off and, and tell us why the biodiversity has anything what to do with the climate? Uh, I want to kind of give... Uh, our, certainly my motivation for focusing on biodiversity in nature, uh, which is that I think, you know, our, our human predicament is becoming very dire and some of the solutions that we, we may be hoping uh, for might not come to fruition. But I think uh, nature has been there for many billions of years and we need to learn how to work with her. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of show uh, a few slides you know, I want to talk about our energy predicament. Uh, global warming, I think most of us and your viewers understand increasingly through the media what's happening. But uh, the main part of our talk, or Jim's talk, I think is going to be focusing on the power of biology and what we might be able to do working with nature to sequester CO2 and restore habitat um, and our role as humans. So <clears throat> the, the main issue that I think... Uh, I, I want to raise and make people aware of is that our hopes for solar and high and wind as being w solutions for transforming our economy, replacing fossil fuels are, uh, I think, very idealistic, um, perhaps even to the point of fantasy, certainly in the, in the next few decades. This is the sort of picture of what the US energy consumption is. And you can see solar in yellow and wind in purple. And if you add up those numbers and put them over the total of 92.9 quadrillion BTUs, I've done the calculation in the lower right corner, they only make up about three and a half percent of our energy mix. More than half, about 80, 85% of our economy is dependent upon fossil fuels, coal oil and natural gas. Um, in Maryland, where I live, it's even worse. <clears throat> the, the ratio is, you know, a little less than 1.4%. Uh, I found this picture for Canada. Uh, it's a little bit dated, but I don't think it's changed very much. The wind in purple, solar in yellow again, and doing the calculation, it's less than 0.2% of Canada, Canada's energy comes from renewables, at least solar and wind. So <clears throat> the issue is how can we transform, this is a global picture on the left in 2018, and this is a team out of Norway that involved 15 other countries in some modeling exercises to try to figure out how could we get to 2050 and grow solar and wind and other renewables as much as possible. So even uh, after- Sorry, but the thing, the, the thing on the right is, is a, the good thing and the thing on the left is a bad thing. And we're trying to get from here to there, right? Correct. The, the thing on the left is current and 2050 on the right is where we'd like to go. So they, they used very aggressive assumptions to see how, how rapidly could we scale up solar and wind, solar in yellow and wind in light blue. Uh, on the left column there. Mm -hmm. um, so even after 30 years, still about half of our energy is coming from oil in red, natural gas in the, in the grayish brown, and coal in the darker, darker gray. 
So we are going to be wedded to fossil fuels for a considerable period of time, meaning that we're going to be emitting CO2. So yes, we need to do this, uh, but we also need to look at ways of drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, this is a recent book published in, in March that sort of examines uh, piece by piece, solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, all the various options to look at what is realistically feasible, what are the environmental costs for some of these things, and I highly recommend it. <clears throat> so here we are on planet Earth uh, in this predicament with uh, energy transition upon us, uh, climate uh, getting worse and worse. How do we solve this? This is a, a recent snapshot from uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory called the Keeling Curve, which shows the kind of uh, incremental addition of CO2 in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and you'll notice uh, the wiggles represent seasonal variation. If we, mm. if we expand one of those wiggles to, this is a two-year snapshot, <clears throat> um, we can see and look at the scale on the left, say we, we pick uh, the low point on the right of about 410 parts per million, and we see it go up to at its peak, you know, maybe 417, 418. So that's that's an increase uh, of seven parts per million, uh, and the equivalent. So that's during the oxidation phase of when plants are senescing in the fall and winter, and and the CO2 is being emitted. But in the next season, it, that amount of stuff is being drawn down by growing nature, by the green plants. So it's it's on the order of seven, eight parts per million per year. And if you stop to think about it, on our planet, we have a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. Uh, when the northern hemisphere is growing, the southern hemisphere is in its fall and winter phase. And so we actually have the two hemispheres working against each other. Some is growing and some is emitting CO2. If we were able to adjust that, the, the magnitude on the planet, uh, if, we, we, if we were to get the, the seasons to align on the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, is probably on the order of 10 or 12 parts per million per year that nature extracts from the atmosphere and puts into green material, woody material, uh, organic matter in the soil. So it's this, this technology, which was invented 3.5 billion years ago, um, that is the workhorse for what uh, Jim is going to be talking about in terms of uh, what we can do to help work with nature to sequester carbon. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Jim. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. So let me I'll say hello to Jim first. Everybody Hello. needs to see your face. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I've got, uh, I always have a hard time figuring out wh which, uh, I have a lot of screens on the, oh, let's see. I'll just give a little background. I, I am a biologist, but my master's degree is in future studies. And uh, that was done, at, you know, I, I got my degrees in Houston. I went to Rice and went to University of Houston. So I just put that up there so, pe you know, that'll be on your recording and um, I'm, I'm a systems thinker. I, I try to teach people how to think in systems and Dana Meadows was probably our best uh, uh, teacher of systems thinking and she died too early here a decade or so ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, can, can you see my cursor down there? Yeah, I do. Okay, so that's good. Uh, Dana had like 12 ways to intervene in, intervene in a system and she said numbers were not worth the time put into them a lot of the time and that was number 12 out of the 12 ways and I, I started looking at well what are the four most important ways and John Todd who's part of New Alchemy Institute in Massachusetts years ago he and his wife started New Alchemy Institute he taught me about self-organizing systems and Alan Savory taught me about making goals and he's the guy that taught me about grazing when I lived in Texas and 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 Lynn Margulis was absolutely essential in this because she turned evolution upside down and said it's about the microbes if you get the microbes right if you keep them happy you have a chance 
And then, but, but then uh, Dana Meadows comes back and says, you know, being in the paradigm mode isn't enough. You have to go back and question your own paradigms. You can't just teach uh, what you think's happening. You have to go back and constantly see what's changing. So that's my first slide. Um, Philip had a, um, you know, a lot of concern about it. We're getting warmer. And this is a kind of complicated slide, but uh, if we go back 60 million years, the Paleocene, the Eocene, the Oligocene, but this is where we are now. You know, we, we've come through an ice age period. This is the temperature, okay, considered now, but we're starting to go up. But for the last, uh, you know, 20,000 years or so, 100,000 years or so, we've been very cold. So we've been several degrees below. Wait a minute. What's this green thing? That's that's the temperature. That's the variation in the temperature. And you see it, it's really squiggling a lot because of ice ages. But if we go back 50 million years, it, the planet was much, much warmer. And it was like 10 or 12 degrees centigrade warmer. Mm -hmm. And the second half of the of the graph is the ice ages, but they so they this jiggling up and down means there's a new ice age for each. Well, up there, and down. There, there were probably a dozen ice ages, and then oh, yeah. you know, and so we we you know humans evolved during the ice ages. So, so and, mm -hmm. and it's interesting that for eight million years the CO two levels never rose above three hundred. For for eight million years, that's the entire human time on the planet. So so we're in something now that we're not not very well adapted for. But, the, but I looked at this chart and, and saw this, and I thought, how in the world did the planet cool so much yeah. in, in the last 50 million years? And there was one kind of big down stroke here in the Eocene, and mm -hmm. there was another one in the Miocene. And uh, so we're gonna, gonna kind of look, this is a Zola, which is kind of a miracle plant that we, we think probably built the permafrost in Siberia and in Canada. Really? Uh, the Arctic Ocean used to be almost fresh water. It was much smaller as the continents moved apart. I'm growing a Zola in the backyard and it gets very, very thick, very fast. And it's incredibly nutritious. It's a, it's a water fern. It's not really algae, it's, it's a water fern. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is, uh, you know, this came out of India. They're trying to figure out how do we start growing a Zola again? And trying to keep the permafrost going, that might be, that might be a clue, you know. Something oh, really? Now, how so? What does it do that's uh, different from other plants? It just grows. It just grows so fast. And and oh, and imagine twenty feet of permafrost. That maybe that started. So that's that's just an example. But but there's you know many more. And and you just you mentioned here a minute ago, uh, the megafauna. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, and we've got a guy up in Siberia, at Pleistocene, trying to start Pleistocene Park. He's bringing in buffalo. He's bringing in muskox. He's and uh, the seamoths. Yeah. And um, and so th this came out. This was uh, National Geographic. The idea that big animals used to they they migrate a lot and they bring a lot of nutrition to wherever they go. They migrate in herds. They poop all over the place. And uh, the idea is, how do we get this carbon into the ground? And a lot of parts of the earth are what Alan Savory called brittle environments, that they, um, they have dry seasons and the microbes have a hard time in the dry seasons. So using the Lynn Margulis thoughts, how do we keep our microbes happy? It's good, it's good, to, have, it's good to have a lot of poop. So here, uh, Scientific American says we have a poop paucity predicament. Mm -hmm. kind of the idea. So, well, now, wait a minute, because that's just the opposite of what I've been reading, you know, that I've been reading uh, Drawdown yesterday, uh, yeah. and, and it said, you know, a certain amount of the methane that, that is, is coming up is coming out of uh, poop that's left on the ground. So now if we, if we increase the amount of poop, that's a problem. Well, why, I'm, I'm why gonna, do you think there's a shortage of poop? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to suggest that that's all mistaken. And the idea yeah. that in, in a healthy system, that poop gets buried by dung beetles almost anywhere in the world. And that's pretty much a human. Uh, humans have, you know, largely killed off the dung beetles, but those could come back. But the other side of it is I, I think that the, the fear of methane coming out of the Arctic is much bigger. This is a much bigger. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I'm worried every night of 
the week about that. So now, so now look at this CO2 levels. This is, you know, 18,000 years ago, they were down to 180. They were down to 240, you know, 12,000, and then it got warmer. And uh, maybe that's colder than we want to go. But this is where we are now. This, I took this in West Texas. Uh, well, actually, I wasn't far from Dallas. And you see areas like this all the time where things are just drying out. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, introduce John Todd and New Alchemy. And there was a huge, this is on Cape Cod, and this is a septage lagoon. And Cape Cod lives on freshwater, very, very small freshwater lens that that's their, their, their water. And this, this was a cranberry bog waste and it was also septage they were pumping into this, this uh, reservoir here. And it was polluting the ponds in the area. And John kind of had this intuition that if I pay attention to the microbes, I can clean the water. And, uh, and he just thought, well, let's put in all the biodiversity we can we can into these tanks. You see the size of them, there may be 500 gallons per tank. What is in those tanks? Well, he just decided to put everything in and let it self-organize and see what happened. And this One is tank will hold what? And the other tank will hold what? Some of them- Oh, oh no, 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 these are all connected. So oh. you're pumping this stuff out and you notice on this end, it's much darker. Oh yeah. By the time it gets on this end. Oh, I see. And then, then you put it in the pond or what? Well, yeah, you just, it's, you just, he was just recirculating it. And what we found is that the pond got cleaner and cleaner over, over the, the sludge on the bottom of this started to disappear. And this, you know, within, within a year, the, these things. But just imagine all these connected and then look at it. Oh, I see. Uh, this, is, this is water stuff in there. I see. I thought yeah, this, this, these were painted or metal containers, but oh, this these, is these holding. Are fiberglass. These are fiberglass. Oh, yeah, okay. And it's, it's got all, all of the gunk. And, yeah. and you're moving it from one tube to another uh, yeah. down the line. Is that it? Well, they filled these with water to start with, and algae started growing in them. And they thought, well, maybe we can uh, get more, more photosynthesis if we have sunlight coming in from all directions. It's like lifting the river out. Oh, out yeah. of the ground so, yeah. so, so you get more dimensions and then uh, this is what it looked like a few months later oh yeah it looks better prettier anyway i don't know and lynn margulis showed up and she saw like this this red stuff this is oxygen uh, you know these these are uh, microbes that get energy from the oxidation of iron and and so they're you kind of like she said well we're gosh we're going back in evolution by looking at this stuff and John said well if you turn around and go the other direction you're going forward in evolution you get you get more biodiverse and the the water that came out of it you know this is the water hyacinths uh, blooming they had some marsh systems here with cattails and and bulrushes but the picture that got me because I was working at a chemical plant at the time was this picture. The water that came out of the system Beautiful. After, after three or four days and i thought can i do this at the chemical plant could you drink so, that water uh i would swim in it you know drinking right. drinking is maybe harder but you know i i wouldn't feel bad this would be swimmable water for sure uh, high right. quality water uh -huh. and uh and i wouldn't be too concerned if i if i drank some of it yeah mm -hmm. but, but this was uh chemical wastewater from a you know we had some very nasty stuff chlorinated solvents, gasoline kind of things. And this came out of the labs. And uh, we thought, well, what can, can we pre-treat stuff before we send it down to the environmental? And, and again, you see this reddish uh, iron bacteria in the first tank. And each tank got better and better and better. And after right, about- now these are, this, this one on the, uh, the top right is, is a close up of some of the contents of what yeah. you see there in the left one. That, that's the first tank. And you see the oxygen bubbles here? This okay. is algae growing like, this is in Texas. So it was very, got very warm. There's these, these, the water became very rich in oxygen. It was quite, quite remarkable. Now and those are little bubbles attached to the wall of the tank? Yeah, or? yeah. They're, they're trying to get out from the algae. The snails would come down here and try to eat the algae and they'd stay in the bubbles sometimes because they were in a, you know, this was an anaerobic tank, you know, in general, because the water coming out of this little, uh, you see up here, we had a marsh system upstream and the water coming out, out of that could have a lot of sulfur in it and stuff. So, so but the snails, uh, you know, they, they're, they're living on the edge here. This is Placostomus, uh, you know, uh, this is a armored catfish. 
let's turn sideways, you know, so the picture would fit, kind of put your head around, but they would just graze on the side of these lighter tanks and you see some goldfish. We had reproducing fish in these systems and everybody said, how is the water getting so clean? Because the water, you know, I'll show you some results. Ammonia is pretty tough to clean. The water that we sent out into Galveston Bay we had 20 parts per million sometimes of, of, of ammonia. And, uh, you know, we, we were able to get it in this little system by, down to one. We could get chloroform down to parts per billion, almost hard, hard to even notice. That's the cleanest water in terms of chloroform we ever saw. And then we had uh, BPA was part of our processes. We made polycarbonate. And that that's really hard to break down, and uh, and we were able to see that disappear. Is that the stuff that that's in plastics that they say are turning you know turning us well males anyway unfertile? Yeah, that's that was the thing because they were using it in baby bottles, and when you heat the baby bottles, the BPA can unzip out of the polymer. So yeah. that's so that's that's and, right. And the ma males are less uh, lower sperm count nowadays. Is that right? Because uh, of well, that, that, it may, that might very well be true. So that's, well, I mean, I, I, I that's what I'm wondering. Are we talking about this BPA? Is what we're talking about? Yeah, that, that was yeah. Theo Colburn did a lot of work on the Great Lakes, and it affected fish, it affected animals, it affected uh, uh, humans too. So, okay. so um, now let me make sure I understand what you're doing. You put any number of god-awful combinations of things together and somehow with if you put enough of the right microbes in there they're going to take care they're all going to clean the thing up i mean this is this is a kind of a theory or a something i don't know what to make of what how well, do you know what you're doing the, 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 this is what's real interesting I spent years trying to figure out what the species were and all that kind of stuff. And I spent four years talking to John saying, you know, which species works better on which chemical and that kind of thing. And John was insisting, no, this is a self-organizing process. The more species you put into the system, you know, the, the, some things will not do well and other things will do well. But the fact that you've got to, so he said, go get mud from the, the healthy streams, go get mud from the the polluted streams go down to the sewage plant, go to the chemical wastewater, you know, plant and, and get all those different organisms in there. That's, this was the Margulis approach to it. Now it was interesting when John did these experiments, the Margulis students from uh, UMass Amherst came out and looked at it and they said, wow, we know the species, but we don't know the ecosystems. This is something new. And this, well, are you are you saying that maybe each of these tanks be, has its own <clears throat> ecosystem? You you move the water from one tank to the next. They're going down the line, right? Yep, yep, and yep. and and everything that's in it goes to the next. I don't know. And and well, how do you, it's communicating what? with the next tank. It's it, it, microbes that are in one tank are going to the next tank. Oh, they it's, can move on their own. Are these yeah. tanks connected? Yes. Yes. There, it's like one long tank. Yeah, and it's and, oh, okay. So and at I, one end, uh, okay. So the water just moving yeah. by itself from from one end to the other, bringing all whatever junk it wants to as it moves. So the Is microbes that, can move pretty pretty freely now. Now here. if you've got something really toxic in there, what 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 he did is he put at the at the far end at the, in tank number twenty. He he had fish in there, and he's he's quite a monitor of fish. He studied ponds for a long time. And he, he said, well, that's kind of the quality control. If the fish aren't acting right, then we've got a, we might have a problem and we'll slow down the flow. But what happened was that uh, the fish started migrating upstream. And uh, so you know, how do you slow the flow? Well, I, I'm, well, I, I, I guess I'm not understanding what this machine is or this, this whole system is. It's, these are separate tanks. The, and you move them from one to the other, or do, are they connected and the water they're, can flow from one end to the next? You, you pipe out of this really, you know, nasty res reservoir, you go into this tank, and okay. they go, and the they overflow goes into the next tank and so forth, okay? The overflow? Yeah. So You take an so, overflow, whenever it gets to a certain stage, you move it to the next well, tank? There's, or there's, a, there's, an, there's a pipes connecting them, you know, so... Oh. So, you know, so this, this will go in and, you know, they'll have water coming in. And so the nasty stuff's going in one side. Yeah. And then we're going through. And as you, you notice that this is after a few 
few weeks of doing this. It's very dark on this end, yeah. but it's getting lighter as we go across. Now down at this left end, you've got the fish. And the fish, and what they notice is that the fish would, you know, the 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 pipes were like two inch pipes, so they they could move upstream if they were finding little fish going upstream. So yeah. they they weren't they weren't too concerned. And the other thing is over time, they, they could increase the flow. The system was learning what how to get all the nutrients out of that water. He stopped talking about a waste stream and started talking about a nutrient stream. Oh see. my goodness! So that and this was done in the nineteen. This was done in the late nineteen eighties, and I, I did this project in 1990, 1990, early 1990s. And I, I knew I had some really toxic stuff. And what we found was that we had four different labs studying this water, and uh, the water coming out was really high quality. So, so that's maybe that's the idea that I became a believer that anybody could clean water. Anybody could clean water by getting enough biodiversity into their system. Hmm. And, uh, and so Meta, basically, the, the, the tanks are the mechanical means of moving water from one tank to another, but you populate the tanks with as much biodiversity as you can, um, you know, taking soil samples water samples, et cetera, and just dumping it in, the system self-organizes. It figures out <clears throat> which kind of initially anaerobic bacteria are needed to break down X, Y, Z, and then the products of that flow into the next tank, and maybe it's a slightly different e ecosystem that is more tolerant of, of the poisons, but it knows how to break down a bit more, and so on and so on. And gradually, as Jim uh, hinted, you kind of recapitulate evolution from the single cell to the higher forms of animals uh, um, and you know, water invertebrates and then the plants floating on top that have figured out how to survive in each of the ecosystems. Okay. And the yeah, fact that ordinary you, people what, could, if I had a whole bunch of uh, uh, plastic containers, uh, could I do a thing like this or? Uh, I've, got one, I've got one in the backyard right now. The, the, the homeschool students build these things all the time and we really? experiments with them, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you start off by filling them all with water and you just put the nasty stuff up at one end and you hope that it'll straighten itself out well, you later? Can start, you can start piping in and, and, at any kind of flow rate you want. We, we, we play around with food waste because we don't want toxic stuff in, uh, in school. But, uh, you know, if you've got stuff left over from, from uh, you know, from food waste and stuff, that's usually... Okay. But now, wait, if you got your waste up at one end, do you fill all the other tanks with plain water and then watch to see what happens? Well, I usually start with rainwater, you know. Right, but you with... fill them. You fill well, all the tanks start... originally. All right. See, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how the whole thing works. Well, but... well this, we can do, yeah. Okay, got it. I think, well, I'm getting it. I'm not sure what I've got. Well, it, it, took me, it took me four years to start doing it. And I, right. was, I was still trying to figure it out. And then I realized that, no, what John was teaching me is uh, you, the, the nature is the intelligence here. It's not the human. The human is putting these things together and, and uh, becoming a catalyst, but it's not the... Well, now you got, you just put in biological stuff, right? You don't put, I mean, you don't go out and get... Uh, uh, cans of paint or you know kerosene or or chemicals you put what you put in is um uh, but bi biological uh in, in this system in this system you know we we started this system on, on the waste pad at the chemical lab at, at, in texas and we had stuff coming out of the lab that included gasoline chlorinated solvents so uh, we we had uh, a lot of uh, high nitrogen compounds, and all of those things broke down by the time they reached this, the, these fish tanks here. But those things all broke down in the system. So you can put just any old chemical, any old... You well, you can try. You don't want to, you, you, you want to figure out what kind of flow rate they can stand. But the idea is if you've got a pond that's polluted and you start mm -hmm. recirculating stuff through a, a healthy system, you know, like maybe you've got a system on the side of your pond or whatever, like like what John did, and you can start cleaning that pond and start restoring the biodiversity. So, okay. Uh, so now the outcome is you've got that pond. That first picture you showed us of a pond. Yeah. That pond is now clean or not? Well, actually, what they were worried about they weren't. This lagoon 
isn't there anymore. They've taken this the waste, you know, the way they've built a better wastewater treatment plant, so they don't dump all that stuff together. But right next to it is a pond called Flax Pond that had about two feet of sludge in it because of the overflow from this the septage lagoon. And in about a year, they, they, what they did is John built a, a, a floating uh, system on top of that flax pond with, with uh, several tanks in it, several biodiverse systems, and it started cleaning up that pond. And flax pond in two years was swimmable for the first time in decades. So it's, All right, I'm impressed. Was, I'm impressed. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a project that, you know, really showed me um, now, now think about this. So the, the, the understanding of microbiomes started here. We think now that, you know, we used to think that what we ate fed the human. And now we're finding out, no, it's better if we're feeding the microbes inside our gut. Yeah. And, and that's stuff that's happened, you know, since the, the 20, 21st century began, that we're starting to realize that we're, we're always evolving a new microbiome depending on what we eat. And uh, what John was doing is showing us, you know, give us a sense of how, how to build a microbiome. So all that's, right. So I'm that's a thing. That. Mm -hmm. And then even go beyond that. What if you wanted to restore an ocean? You build a catamaran, you have four big tanks on there, and you put, you know, several ecosystems that are ocean ecosystems, and you ply the, you know, you go into polluted areas, and you start building the microbes that could help heal that system. You know, maybe you go from a biodiverse area and get all these critters, and then you take them to a less biodiverse area and you seed the, you seed a healthy shoreline. And, you know, that's, hmm. that was, that was this idea of ocean arcs, you know, an ocean restorer. Hmm. And, you know, it's the same idea that, that nature knows how to do this. So that was one, th that was one time when I thought, well, nature's going to, you know, we're going to survive maybe if we work with nature, you know, that we will have a better chance. But maybe my second most amazing thing that I found was, was for years, I was trying to figure out how do you graze in Nevada because it's the driest state in the lower 48. It's the, it's the driest state in, in America. And uh, then I saw this, this picture. And this is in the, this is in northeastern Nevada, and they get about eight or you know they get about eight or ten inches of rain a year at most, and it's usually a snow. So they've got a lot of snow in these mountains, and then April and May comes along and it gashes out these huge these huge uh, gashes in the river. And uh, oh, but that's a river at certain times, huh? Yeah, yeah. The, the, oh. this is flash flooding. Within a few weeks, the, the water would be gone. And Carol Evans out there was working with ranchers for years to try to figure out how to get the grazing right to, to keep water in these streams longer. And beaver showed up and they don't know where they came from. And that's that picture that you saw before. Oh, the, right. the beaver didn't need wood. They didn't need a forest. I always thought beaver were forest animals and uh, you had to have wood around. And it turns out they'll start with mud. If, if there's water, they'll figure out how to stop it. And in fact, once they get it stopped, they'll start building these huge channels underneath because the, the, the ponds have to last all summer long. And, uh, you know, so that, that, that water that used to come off these hills would stay in the river all summer long. And these mm -hmm. ashes here, so, so in, in Susie Creek, they've seen two and a half, three feet of sediment build up. And it's probably... Um, you know, 10 tons of carbon per acre per year, but nobody's studying it, you see. So say that again. What, what we're seeing here, this, this green front thing, that is, that is sequestering carbon. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, all what right. And, and, and so that, if we could do that on a bigger scale, we'd sequester more carbon. In, in the United, you know, we've lost probably worldwide a billion acres of wetlands. And, you know, if we put those wetlands back, that would be a huge chunk of the, the, the global warming. But, but who's good at making wetlands? And it's, of course, so, mm -hmm. so this was, this was uh, the biologist. She, she's a fish biologist working in Nevada. And she wanted to, you know, and she was working with ranchers to try to help restore the lands. And, uh, and, and the beaver showed up. 
And the ranchers were really concerned because they say, we've been trying to get this right for years and now he's going to come mess everything up. <laughs> and, and Carol just said, well, why don't we wait and see? And Carol also, we, we brought Carol to Boston to, for a bio for climate conference. And the first thing she said was, I'm not coming without ranchers. The ranchers have to tell their story too, because they've been working on this for a long time. And I, I actually have, I think what we ought to do is uh, I ought to stop the share right now. And I can mm -hmm. show you a, a short video of Carol actually doing this. Oh yeah, okay. So let's see if it's, it's about two minutes and she's putting a movie together and they've, 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 got, they've got a film crew and uh, just kind of introduce you to Carol Evans. My name is, oh, is that a woman? Oh, there she is a person. Huh? Since I became a Bureau of Farm Management Biologist in 1988. I'm retired now, but I'm still following streams. The streams here have stories to tell. When you change the way cows graze on a stream, the plants grow back and the beaver come in and that changes everything. That is what happened on Dixie Creek a little stream near Elko, Nevada. This is Dixie Creek's story. In 1990, the agency I worked for built some fences on Dixie Creek so the grazing could be managed. In other words, over the last three decades, cattle could be on some of the area, some of the time, but not all of the area, all of the time. This is Dixie Creek, 30 years later, when the plants grow and the beaver come back, the magic happens. Scientists are starting to think this is how streams here used to look and function before the time of European settlement. There are a lot of ways to manage livestock grazing on streams so the plants come back. And I spent a whole career working with ranchers here in northeastern Nevada doing just that. But this story is about what happens once those plants come back. Okay. Beaver need the plants that grow along streams for food and for materials to build their dams. So when managing livestock grazing leads to plants like sedges and rushes and willows coming back, the beavers show up and a dry bed of gravel turns into a magnificent wetland. What could this teach us about what we've lost and what we can find again? What can this teach us about how to heal an ailing planet? That's wonderful. In January oh, 2019, some friends and I set out to tell the story of a recovered Dixie Creek and its beaver over the course of a year. What if people like scientists and sportsmen, like ranchers? Now, what's really interesting to me about this picture is when the, when the snow melts in the spring now, it, it used to wash away all this stuff that's trying to grow in the riverbed. And mm -hmm. now we've got the, the willows and the aspens starting to make it through you know the the flood season the flood season has just been diminished a great deal and uh they, the water stays on the land longer and i just thought this is this is because the west used to look like this and if if the if if you have animals that are you know they're in the the wet meadows at certain times of the year but they're but they're also moving up and, and some of this sagebrush starts changing to perennial grasses that's kind of their goal is how to get these animal you know the grazing animals farther up up the hill and, uh, oh. and rehydrating uh, some of this area too. So. Oh, yeah. okay. so Jim, perhaps you could say a little bit how the animals are managed and how that affects the land. Well, we're, we're, we're gonna get to that. Okay, <laughs> see, I, didn't, I couldn't understand much of what she was saying. I could see the pictures though, and they're sure impressive. The contrast is astounding. But I think the big thing that she said is maybe this is what the West used to look like. That what Dixie Creek is more, so all the rivers, you know, like when Lewis and Clark went across the country, you know, all, did all the rivers have, uh, you know, we, we probably had 200 million beaver in the, on the continent. And, and Canadians uh, got rid of their beaver and Americans got rid of their beaver and the British helped get rid of as many beaver as possible because they didn't want Americans going to California. And uh, yeah, so that, so I'll just kind of, I'll just show another 30 Land seconds managers, here. Or even people who just like to be outside could share a common vision of what these streams could be, a place where beaver could thrive and create these magnificent wetlands full of water and wildlife. Every stream has a story to tell, what it once was, what it can be again.
How grazing can be managed to get the plants to grow back, which attracts the beaver, and how together those two things can offer hope for a better future. Mm -hmm. So what we need are beavers. And it, now are you saying that the, uh, uh, that last part of that video, they showed um, uh, more greenery up on the on the hills. Uh, well, is is that something that goes with the whole pro process or do you expect I, that? I, I, I would say that's the goal, but I, most of what I saw was sagebrush and juniper. So it's, it's stuff that's what, what happens if you get good grazing going on farther up the hills is that the land starts holding more moisture and the sagebrush starts to die, die away. Sagebrush can't stand much moisture at all. So it's, oh, yeah. so it's kind of like you go from a, and the goal is you want to go from less sagebrush, more, more perennial grasses. It's, now what, what makes it hold more moisture up higher? All, all that poop. The, from, from what animals? Well, in Nevada, it used to be prong, pronghorn, and, and you know, but if, if you've got cattle, that's, that's what you've got. Let, let me... Uh, no, but up there, what was she growing there? Or was she growing any uh, animals there? Uh, she wasn't raising any animals. She's a biologist. She was just watching, the, she's been watching the stream for 30 years. Mm. She's an incredible uh, uh, field biologist because she stayed in the same area for so long. And, and she's mostly been working lately to try to figure out how to keep the the Lohontan trout viable in the streams, so you have to have streams that are viable. So beaver are really helpful at that. She's finding freshwater mussels in places that haven't been in years. And this is in the driest state in the country. What, what, what excites me about all this is if you can do this in Nevada, you can do it in any state in the country. You can do it in Dakota or West Texas or mm -hmm. where it's gone dry because we've, we've taken the grazing animals off the land and put them on feedlots. We've killed off the wild herds so, you know, getting the wild herds back would be great, but we've got to close the feedlots. That's where the methane problem is with animals. If you can build soil, soil, you know, animals eating grass and building soil is, is a methane sink. More, more methane goes, is consumed by that soil than, uh, so, it's, so yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, you know, I, I have to say, I was just yesterday reading a thing by uh, uh, Drawdown on uh, land use. And uh, some of what they had to say worried me because it didn't fit what I was hoping and what I think I'd read elsewhere, what you just said, in fact, because what they said is that animals raised in feedlots or fed grain, I don't think they talked about whether they're raised, but obviously mm -hmm. if you're going to feed them grain, you're going to have them in feedlots. So the animals in feedlots actually produce less methane in their burps and farts than than the animals that eat grass. I'm, I'm not is, concerned about that. I'm concerned no. about they put all the poop into lagoons and the lagoons go anaerobic and they make methane like crazy. It's the poop uh, that's the problem. The poop needs to go back on the land. I'm not concerned. You know, we, we've always had animals on the land ever since humans have been on the planet and they always pooped and they always fired because it's very hard to break down cellulose. But, uh, but it used to be that you'd build soils that could hate that were, you know, soils, soils have to breathe, you know? So, so it's like this idea, how do you build a good soil? And this is kind of what uh, Alan Savory, you know, why he's so important. And yeah. soil, soils that have, that have enough, a healthy soil has enough gaps in it, you know, enough, enough air spaces that water can flow through it and air can flow through it. Mm. And, uh, and the mycelium, the, the fungi can breathe, but also if you've got methane in the air, it's scrubbed by, you know, that breathing soil will take the methane out. Methane's such a nutrient for microbes that it would just, if we could get the CO2 levels to start dropping, the methane levels would start dropping much faster because it's such a, such a nutrient for so many microbes. Wait, say that again. So, uh, I, it didn't sink in. Would you okay. say getting a good grazing plan on, on these dry lands all over the world and getting perennial grasses back on the land is going to make soils that breathe, that have air spaces. And if these soils breathe, you know, you're going to start seeing, well, one, you're going to see the perennial grasses are pumping CO2, making sugar, pumping it into the ground to feed the mic microbiome in the ground. But the other side of it is 
that the methane is such high energy molecule that the microbes that live in the soil are going to consume that like crazy. So if we could ever bend that curve and start getting the CO2 levels to go down, the methane would go down faster. Okay, now I'm really interested in that notion that there are methane eating microbes. That, that right. there's, but now I don't think, I, my impression is that they're, they're, they're kind of not very hardy and you don't, you don't find them just everywhere. They're, the, 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 maybe, you know, my thought was, oh good, let's go sprinkle some microbes around and we'll just take care you, of everything. You find that they're aerobic. They, they, they run on oxygen. The problem in lagoons is that you, the microbes in lagoons are, the water goes anaerobic when you put all that poop in there. And, uh. and then you've got methano, methanogens, you know, you have methanogens, that they're trying to get energy, they don't have any, ox, or they're trying to get an electron acceptor, they don't have any oxygen to work with, so they start making methane. You know, it, oh. that's, that's the, that's the, the, the micro, that, this is why studying the microbes is so important. But, but methanotrophs live in oxygenated soils. Methanogens uh. live in, you know, places that, that are anaerobic. So, and, and so we're, we're taking these animals, putting them in feedlots when they ought to be eating grass, we're putting them in feedlots, they still poop and the poop never gets back to the land. That's the problem, you know. That, mm. The, the way I see it. So that's, um, and, uh, so here, here, I'm trying to figure out where we are. So I, I, I drew this picture about 15 years ago and I thought somebody at Harvard would be all upset by it or whatever. I've, I've never, I believe it a lot more now than I did then. But, you know, a big part of carbon going into the ground is taking all that poop and burying it. And we used to have dung beetles everywhere in the world. And we've killed dung beetles in a lot of ways with pesticides and so forth, but we've, we also use antibiotics on the animals, which hurts the dung beetles. And so- Oh trying, yeah, okay. So we're trying, trying to figure out a genetics, so the animals better adapted to the, the grasslands and the weather and stuff like that, or buffalo. They usually, I've never heard of antibiotics being used on buffaloes and trying to get these dung beetles. And you say, well, where do dung beetles you know, you think about every dung, dung ball becomes an ecosystem for dung beetles and they roll them up in little balls and they bury them. And, uh, you know, maybe two or three feet down. So that I, I, in the 1990s, I thought this was the main source of getting carbon back into the soil. And here's where the dung beetles lived. The, you know, they didn't live in the permafrost, but they, they lived everywhere else. Oh, I, mean, I see. All the red is the place where they lived, I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so that was that was one thing. But then if you go back to my little chart here, on the other side is perennial grasses. Mm -hmm. The other thing here is this idea of hoof action. The, what Savory started to notice was the more hoof action there was, now you, you want to have a lot of a lot of impact and then you give the land a chance to recover. So in New England, you might have animals come back once a month. Uh, you know, lots of animals come back once a month and it recovers, you know, they're, they're there for, for a couple days and then they move on and uh, they come back in the next month. But in West Texas, it might be twice a year. It might be six months before you bring the animals back. In Nevada, it might be two years, you know. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the idea of how to get the, Alan was always saying, it's not the number of animals that's important. It's the, the, the recovery time, getting the timing right. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing was all the poop is important to restore the soils. And there's no, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there's no single formula for uh, how quickly you want to bring them back, the animals back, right? It, it depend, it, and that's what Alan was good at. And John too, is the idea of be an observer and, and, you know, realize that the intelligence is out there trying to teach you how to manage the land. And, uh, you know, so you look at how how much the land is still um, broken up, or yeah. what do you what do you look for if you're going to go look at a piece of soil and say, how is it time for me to bring my animals back? Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Did you get that? But the other thing is, like in some places in West Texas, the ranchers were trying to figure out how to make this happen faster, and they they used to have several months a year where they have to feed the animals hay because it was just you know, mm -hmm. too, too dry or whatever. They didn't have enough forage. So they'd bring hay in 
and they thought we don't want to feed these animals anywhere near the barn or where whatever in a central area we want to take the hay to the worst piece of ground so that that, that way the animal nutrition will you know if you take the hay out to the worst piece of ground the, the animals will follow you out there and they'll poop all over the place and you'll start having a, a, a you'll start recovering that system and and do the animals themselves uh they're trampling does that force the poop into the ground or does it well, just that, that could do some of that, but I, but it's just, it's much more, if you get the dung beetles there, they're going to bury it and they're going to bury it pretty fast. But yeah, the animal, the hoof action, mostly what that does is that helps restore the water cycle, that the water doesn't just run off. And a lot of places in West Texas now, they haven't had animals in decades and it's like concrete. There's no organic matter. It's been blown off by sunlight. And uh, it just, it just, they call it caliche because there's so much calcium at the surface. So, so that's part of why the hoof action is really important when you're trying to get started. And then you want to build the soils. The, the prairie soils used to be 10 feet deep, 20 feet deep, you know, here, I'll show that. Yeah. And uh, so that was, you know, another, another kind of, how do you, how do you get big blue stem? Here's, here's what we try to grow on our, the turf grasses we grow on our lawns. <laughs> you see, how, you see yeah. and that way you're dependent on Scott's chemical company to, yeah. to keep your lawn green. Or but the idea, of, if, if you've got stuff growing six feet high, you might have roots going down even further. You might have roots going down 10 feet. In the last few years is that big blue stem makes a lot. It's starting to show up in places where they get their grazing right in, West, in the West. And people are saying, this must be an invasive species. And then they find out that a hundred years ago, it was all over. Mm. Blue stems were all over the West at one time when there were a lot of beaver and there were a lot of, uh, you know, pronghorn and buffalo and so forth. But imagine here, you're making, you're making glucose in a healthy system. Maybe a third of the glucose goes into the roots and then another third goes into the soil microbes. This is the third part of the story. That healthy ecosystems, healthy plant ecosystems give a lot of their sugar to the mycorrhizae because the mycorrhizae can go find the minerals. The piece, lichens are an example of how plants and, and uh, fungi co-evolved. And, uh, and now we're starting to think that all plants are dependent on fungi is it, at some point in their evolution. And uh, try, trying to feed like corn, all kinds of chemicals and stuff like that, we're losing their ability to get phosphorus from the land to get calcium from the, the rocks and stuff like that. And so that's, that's kind of the third part of the this picture you're showing is one little critter. Are those roots all from that one? This, this, this is a, a, a little tiny, uh, the beginning of a, a, a pine. And 90% okay. of what you see here is, is the mycorrhizae, it's fungi. So, Jim, we just have a few minutes left. I wonder if you would let me show one slide. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll have to get off of here then. Uh, don't go too far because I sure like what you're saying. Okay. Go ahead, Phil. Clearly, we have Jim back. But, um, no, that's fine. Go I believe ahead. this this chart, I think Alan Savory had this created. It's basically showing... Uh, degraded, very degraded uh, soils around the world. A lot of the, the very degraded stuff is what humans once managed, but uh, through ignorance abused to the point where it is no longer fertile. But what Jim and Alan and others are hinting at is that we now know how to bring this back to life. So there's a huge potential around the planet working with nature and the microbes and the plants and the animals to bring this back from, you know, looking like a desert to being green again. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. That is huge. <clears throat> but it, it looks like one stupendous engineering project. Wow. Who can take that on? I mean, well, that's that's, you know, the beaver. I mean, we... <laughs> We decimated, literally decimated from about 220 million beaver. We're down to around 20 now. Uh, but there are restoration projects uh, around the country that are trying to bring them back. For instance, in the Sierra Nevadas, one of the ways to counter the loss of snowpack because of climate change is to, to ask beaver to go up into the mountains and create ponds at higher elevations with leaky dams so that 
instead of it all melting, the, very, the, the little snow that we do get, it gets saved and distributed over the course of a, of a summer rather than lost all in the spring. Well, now you mentioned wetlands, and uh, uh, you've got me convinced that that's an important part of the equation. I think we're t- our time's up. And uh, I probably have to say goodbye now, but, uh, but... But I'll just say, at some point, um, where this was leading us, I, I wrote a scenario for how to get the CO2 levels in the atmosphere back to 300 by the time Halley's Comet comes in 2061. <laughs> my, my homeschoolers are going to be 60 years old. They were all born right at the millennium. They are born right in the year 2000. And they studied Halley's Comet, and they thought, well, we can see it, we can see it. And they says, well, yeah, but you're going to be 60 years old. And I thought, what would be really cool is if we, if we instead of spending money on uh, the, the Defense Department, we had a Civilian Conservation Corps analog for the globe. And that's is already starting to happen uh, with Michael Liu's uh, ecosystem restoration camps and so forth. But I, I wrote that scenario with the idea that nature has the capacity to bring us back to 300 in, in 40, in within 40 years. If that's what we chose to do, if, if we want to go to war with each other, it's not going to work out. But, uh, mm-hmm. but 300 is, is, is doable with what we've got available if that's what we wanted to do. So we need wow. people to share. Well, I want to be on your team. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> We're certainly, we have the same goals. Boy, uh, your, your figures are uh, amazing. I don't know how many people would, would, uh, agree with you that that's feasible but i want to believe it and i'll try (laughs) well when john when john todd you know i was trying to get the you know trying to get him to explain it to explain it to explain it he says no build it learn let nature teach you alan savor the same thing build it you know start start moving these animals and getting that poop up back out on the land instead of in in your feedlots or in your lagoons well, <laughs> thank you. That's you wonderful. Might dirty. You might get dirty, though. It's, it's kind of a dirty business. <laughs> Sounds like it. But I, I think uh, I'm past the phase of going out and getting my hands in the soil. But I, I'd be glad to do my best to help people who want to do that. But what so, if our kids, that we, we send them into the military and they get all dirty and they do absolutely. nasty things? What if they were restorers? Like, Better you know, dirty than bloody, right? Yeah, dirty is better than bloody. (laughs) That's right. Bless your hearts. You're doing great things. And this is really impressive and wonderful work. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Okay, Okay. Mm bye-bye.